If you listen to the words of the song, it uh, was kind of setting up a situation that's not uncommon where people have diverse opinions about Christ, about Scripture. You know, if you were to uh, get a handful of people together and, you know, ask them, well, what do you think of Jesus? You know, you'd have typically some answers like, well, um, I think he was a great spiritual leader, or I think he was a great teacher, or uh, I'm not sure he was a real historical figure, but he's a nice idea. You know, you might have various things. Like that. And then some, some would no doubt say, well, no, I believe he's the one that rose alive from a tomb like this after being dead for three days and who is truly the creator of the universe and the one and only solution to mankind's ills and savior of the world. You'd have some that feel that way, believe that. But you'd have a diverse group of opinions. One time Jesus, he was going along with his disciples and he suddenly stopped and he turned on them and he said, who do men say that I am? And they turned and said, well, you know, Lord, some say maybe you're some version of Elijah and some say maybe you're si some kind of a version of Jeremiah and uh, some other sort of a prophet. And then he turned to his disciples and he said, but who do you say that I am? And there was this silence. And then Peter, not being able to bear silence for very long, he speaks up and he says, you're the Christ, you're the Son of the living God, meaning you're the Messiah, we know it. You're the one that all of Israel and all of human history has been waiting for. You're the Christ, you're the Messiah, you're the Savior, you're the Son of the living God. And Jesus turns to him and he said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Peter's, you know, kind of whole name. He said, because this wasn't something that was revealed to you by other humans. This was revealed from the Father in heaven. And he said, and upon this confession of yours, Peter, I will build my church. The word church, as Jesus used it, the ecclesia in Greek, the called out assembly, which he is continuing to build right on down through time. And so he said that it's this belief that I am the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God, upon which uh, I will build this called out assembly, the church, the church which is made up of men and women, boys and girls from all over the, the ages, all over the different places geographically who put their faith and trust in Christ as a Messiah. But the thing that I really want to get to you is that how highly Christ valued Peter's faith, his statement. You see, Peter was expressing an intelligent faith. He was saying, you know, I, you know other people are saying all these things about you, but I know who you are. And Peter had not just an intelligent and an accurate faith, but he had an active faith. He had already dedicated a large portion of his life, nearly three years, to following Jesus. He would end up dedicating the rest of his life. He would ultimately go to a martyr's death rather than disown Jesus as he did earlier in his time. Um, so he lived his whole life active, seeking to make Christ known and the truth about Christ and the truth about life known to as many people as would be accepting of it. He had an intelligent faith. It was accurate and it was active. Now we're going to meet a guy in Scripture that, that Christ also gets very excited about this guy's faith. But that raises a question. Why is it that God seems to care so much about faith? I mean, look at these Scriptures from the book of Hebrews to just kind of get us started. Maybe we'll look at them from the Hebrews. We, it's magical the way we do this. The so way they see what I'm doing up here. All right. It says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And without faith, what does it say? It is impossible to please God. Can you please God without faith, according to Scripture? No. No. It's impossible. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek him. So you can see the emphasis that, that God puts on faith. And were you to read that entire 11th chapter of Hebrews, which I know you'll do sometime on your own, you'll find 15 different people that are listed there from the Old Testament. And each time it talks about their faith and then it was expressed by action. Faith and expressed by action. Faith and it goes all the way from Abel to Noah to Enoch and, and all down. And so faith is this very important issue to God. But, but why? I mean, is, is, is it just something... Uh, arbitrary? I mean, what, what do we mean faith? You know, we know when we have conversations with people, they say, well, you know, I've, I've got my faith. And that can mean almost anything. It, it might mean that that's a, a certain denomination that they were brought up in. They say, well, yeah, uh, that's my faith. It might mean um, it's a certain political swaying that they have. It could mean nearly anything. But, but why? Why does this matter to God? I mean, the scripture goes to say this. It says that faith is the condition. Let me go further. 
The scripture is very blunt and clear and redundant about this. In the New Testament, it says that the singular condition for having one's sins forgiven and being given entrance into the kingdom of heaven eternally, the single condition is to put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has died on the cross for our sins, paying our sin debt, and rose again from the grave. And it says that when a person puts faith in Christ, meaning we are becoming his follower, God erases our sin record, and he gives us entrance into his family and his kingdom. It's the singular condition. Now, it was not the condition in the Old Testament. I don't know if you've ever given this much thought or not. Christ wasn't there. So how could salvation by faith in Christ be there? Well, in the Old Testament, God progressively revealed himself little by little by little by little as the Old Testament was developing and people were, based, were judged then based on their faith in God to the degree that they understood him to the degree that he had revealed himself to them they didn't have whole Bibles but now the condition for 2,000 years has been faith in Christ why Christ? why? Well, why couldn't it be something else? because of this thing that I just said progressive revelation God has little by little progressively revealed himself to mankind but then when it came to Christ he pulled out all the stops the scripture says that in Christ we see the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form in Colossians 2 9 and 10 it says when you look at Christ this is it this is all that God can tell us about himself this is God saying here I am completely it's kind of like you had a mysterious pen pal for a long time and you never saw them or met them personally and then suddenly they show up at your house and you say how do you like me now you know and so the condition for salvation is based on faith in God now that he's revealed himself completely in Christ. There can be no other way. But I still haven't answered the question, why faith? I mean, could God have just made up any kind of condition? Could it have been like, okay, if you um, eat a tuna fish sandwich on Fridays, I'll forgive your sins and you'll enter my kingdom of heaven. Could he have made just any arbitrary condition? Could it, could it have been? Or could there be something more substantial? Let's think about this. We know God is a personal moral being. We know that we're personal moral beings. Moral beings. We have will, we have thought, we have reason, we have feelings. And so God says that since he's the creator and that he is the only one in the universe that has all knowledge and has the character to rule and sustain the universe, that, that he must protect the universe by maintaining singular rule of the universe. Now this is, this is a problem because we're free moral agents, you know. And so how is God going to rule over us because it's the only way that there can ever be harmony in the universe. The reason that the world is in such bad shape now is because we're making our own laws and just doing whatever we feel like periodically. So God says ultimately he's going to bring all of uh, intelligent beings back under his rule. But how? How can he do that in a way that I'm going to feel good about it? Let me give you three ways that he could have done it. Well, he, first of all, could have brought us all under his rule so that the universe would have peace and harmony by force he could have made us kind of like automatons you know sort of like uh, I have no control over myself that whatever God says I just just kind of robotically automatically do we could have been made machines he would have at least had harmony in the universe but for me that wouldn't have been very satisfying I don't like to be forced to do anything do you do you like to be forced to do things okay he could have also used fear he could have said, okay, I'll tell you what, uh, here's my will, I love you, it's good for you, but if you don't do it, there is also instant leprosy, instant lightning bolts, instant, you, you know, he could, have, he could have had our eyes pop out of our head, you know, if we told a lie, our tongue could have swelled up the size of our arm, and, you know, he could have done all kind of creative things. Had I been God, I would have uh, utilized some of these mechanisms, no doubt. <laughs> good that I'm not God. But he could have used fear in a serious way. He could have said, if you don't obey me, Bad things will happen to you instantly. There will be no blinking, no, no waiting. But I don't know about you. I don't, like, I don't like to be pushed around. I don't like to be threatened. Is there anybody here you like to be threatened? Can I see your hands? Okay, you like to be threatened. Okay. Well, I'll threaten you some. <laughs> Most of us don't like... You misunderstood the question, I'm sure. Most of us don't like to be forced... And we don't like to be threatened or use fear. So God could have used force to bring the universe. Somebody, you've got to get the heat, man. You're, you're cooking me up here. Somebody, man, man the thermostats, please. The fir these first two units, turn them down. Um, you should be able to just go down on the dial. Um, uh, you'll have to do that one over there or it won't work too. But um, he could have used force. He could have used fear. 
But that's not very satisfying for free moral agents. I don't want to be forced to do things. I don't want to be pushed and scared into doing things. So how could he ever bring the universe of intelligent beings to a place of perfect harmony with his will, which is the only way life can work? And the answer is faith. It's not an arbitrary principle. It is the only possible condition of salvation. And faith means this, that God reveals himself to intelligent beings and says, now I have demonstrated that I'm loving, that I'm good, that I'm unselfish, that I'm trustworthy, that I love you more than you love yourself, that I know what's best for you and want what's best for you. Look, I'll die on the cross to prove how unselfish and loving I am. Now, now that you see that I'm trustworthy, will you trust me? And for those who that wins their heart, and mine is one, then obedience becomes a delight. It's spontaneous. I, I use my own free will. I joyfully, ex with, with exceeding energy, seek to obey God always. Why? Because I trust him. He knows what's best for me. I don't and wants what's best. Faith is not an arbitrary principle, and that's why faith is so important to God. He really, really cares about our faith, and he wants our faith to be an intelligent faith. He wants us to understand him as he actually is. He wants us to understand what he's actually accomplishing in, in this period called time, and he wants us to understand how to relate to him, how to work with him, and so on. An intelligent faith. Now, we're going to look at a guy in the Gospel of Luke that has an intelligent faith and it gets this tremendous response from the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are here today and you have an intelligent faith, I'm telling you, you may not know it, but God is excited about you. You, you are a joy to his heart. He is thrilled with, with intelligent faith. And we wanna break that down a little bit and show you what that is, but essentially it's a faith that is accurate and it's a faith that is active. Let's turn now to the Gospel of Luke and we'll be looking at chapter 7. It'll be page 730 or 1022. 730 or 1022. This is a tough time of year because you need heat for a while and then you've got to go to air conditioning and, you know, it's, it's tough. And I complain a lot in between. <laughs> Table was kind of just as you're flying on your page here. It was kind of cool. We, we started a Bible institute, in, started the Bible institute in here uh, this past Monday. And, you know, we've run it before. Um, but man, it, it, was, it was just so cool. There was like, I don't know, 260, 270 people in here. And, and I'm just so thrilled that there's now this desire amongst so many of our people to go deeper with their faith, to, to know for themselves uh, what God has revealed about himself. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm, and by the way, it's not too late for you. If you want to come out Monday night, it's from 6.30 to 8.30. I spend the last half hour just kind of answering questions. Uh, so if you want to plug in and kind of go deeper on some things, come on out on Monday night. Okay. Enough commercials. I've done a lot of announcing today. <laughs> Let's go to Luke now. And we'll start with chapter 7, verse 1. It says, When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now, when it says he had finished saying all this, it was the Sermon on the Mount that he had just finished saying. Verse 2. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some of the elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't, don't trouble yourself for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. And I, I say to my servant, do this, and he does that. When Jesus heard this, he was, what is the word? Amazed. Well, that in itself is quite a statement. He was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd, notice he wants the crowd to know how he feels about this guy. Turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had sent returned to the house and found the servant. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Now this series that we're in is called Found. And the basis of it is that 
uh, each week we'll see that there's something found of great value in these messages. Uh, in this case, Jesus found a man with what I'm calling an intelligent faith, and he was excited about it. I said each week prior to this that, that we tend to have a, or, or we, we tend to believe that if something is really valuable, it's got to be hard to get, hard to acquire, hard to find. You know, diamonds are difficult to acquire, gold is difficult to acquire, but we think if something's easy and available, maybe it's not that important, but that is actually the opposite truth. What God's Word makes very clear is that the things that are actually the most valuable and important in life are easily accessible to anyone who has the right frame of mind and heart. They're, they're open, they're, they're hidden as it were in plain sight and each week I hope that you'll see that that's truth. Today it's, it's an intelligent faith. You and I can each possess an intelligent faith that is not beyond the reach of any of us and it is of great price to God. I hope you see now how important faith is. It is the reconciling principle that God has placed in this universe and when he sees the kind of faith in our hearts that he saw in this centurion, he's excited about it. And I want you to know that God's excited about your faith if you have an intelligent faith. Now, these centurions were interesting guys. They were, they were the ultimate warrior, the ultimate Roman soldier. The Roman Empire had conquered, you know, the world of their day. And these guys were the heart and soul of the Roman army. They trained their men. They inspired them. They led them. They commanded them. Uh, they, they were the rocks in that. They would be over 100 men, and a legion would have 6,000 men altogether. So they'd have 60 of these, these centurions that would be over a legion. Interesting little note. In the New Testament... There are seven references to centurions. Every single one of them is positive. Every one. One of the centurions was at the foot of the cross and says, you know, this was no normal man. This surely was the son of God. There was a centurion in the book of Acts chapter 15 that Peter was sent to by God to give him the message of the gospel and he turns to Christ right away. There was another centurion that saved Paul's life when he was being pulled apart in a mob. Another centurion saved Paul's life a second time when a, there was a plot to kill him. And, and so every time you find a centurion, a Roman centurion in scripture in the New Testament, it's positive. I, I, don't, I don't know why, but I do know this. They were noble per people and noble people tend to be open to truth. And maybe that's what it was all about. I don't know. But let's put this in a historical context. Here Jesus is with a number of Jews gathered around him, following him. This centurion sends his servants or sends some Jews to Jesus. He himself wouldn't even go because he knew that in those days a Jew would have nothing to do with a the Roman. They hated the Romans. They despised them. They were tired of being oppressed by Gentile empires. You know, first it was the Babylonians, then it was the Persians, then it was the Greeks, now it was the Romans. For 500 years, nearly 600, they had been oppressed and they hated it. And one of their criteria, one of their litmus tests for the Messiah before they would ever accept somebody as the Messiah was he had to be a Roman hater and he had to be willing to overthrow the Roman Empire. And here's Jesus praising this Roman centurion, the ultimate warrior, the ultimate picture of oppression to the Jews. Very interesting set of circumstances. Could have caused many of the Jews to hate Jesus even more because they didn't have an accurate, intelligent faith. We'll get to that in just a bit. But Jesus doesn't respond the way that he would have been expected to as a Jew. He's very open to this guy. He's very excited. Now the guy, the Roman, is, is a very different cut of Romans. It's said specifically, this guy loves our nation and he built our synagogue. This guy, this Roman centurion, built a Jewish synagogue. He was probably, what we know historically, were prosel was a proselyte. These were individuals that when they became exposed to the God of Judaism, the God of the Bible then, it resonated in their hearts and they became followers even though they were, in this case, a Roman centurion or whatever. So this guy was probably already not very steeped in Jewish scripture, but, but maybe he knew something. But he knew enough to know that a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, which is what Jesus was, was not, was not supposed to come into the house of a Gentile. A Gentile was just anybody that was not a Jew. It, it was thought to believe, uh, they believed it was ritually defiling. And so this Roman centurion who's in the power place humbles himself to this peasant Jewish carpenter rabbi. And that was a really strange set of dynamics going on there. Strange that Jesus would respond to this Roman. Strange that the Roman was so humble to Jesus, this peasant carpenter, you know, rabbi. 
So everything there was, it was an unusual set of dynamics. But the thing that you see in this centurion, the Jews that were, were going through scripture to prepare themselves for when the Messiah would arrive, for the most part, they didn't accept Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. The first Christians were almost all Jews. Many Jews did become followers of Jesus in Jesus' day after he rose from the grave. Okay, but for the most part, they rejected him. Well, why? What, what's behind this? Well, it's what I just described. It, it was this Jewish inferiority thing. They were so sick of being oppressed by other nations. First the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, now the Romans. They were tired of it. And so the only way they could cope with their feelings of inferiority is they would have something on their oppressors. And the something that they had on their oppressors was this. We're the chosen of God. God likes us and he hates you. You're Gentile dogs. That's what they called anybody that was not a Jew. That's what they believed. They believed if they just brushed up against you, you, they were defiled. It was a way of coping with their own feelings of inferiority, whereas what they should have been doing is thinking, why are we in this condition? Why hasn't God restored our kingdom? And it was because of their spiritual state. But anyway, point being, you, you, you see how all these dynamics were working together. The Jews' minds were prejudiced against Jesus because they wanted somebody to overthrow the Roman Empire. This Roman centurion, who had probably just fragments of understanding of God, had no prejudice. He was noble. He was honest. He was open. And he couldn't miss it. Jesus had done miraculous healings, many, many miraculous healings. He had said things that no human had ever said before. He displayed a kind of a kindness and love that had never been seen. So when this Roman centurion, with no prejudice, with no bigotry, with no inferiority things to work out, he sees Jesus and says, I know, I know this is of God. No, nobody is like this. No, no human has ever done these kind of miracles. Open blind eyes, you know, healed every disease. All the, he knew it. And he says, no human's ever said these things. Certainly, certainly somehow this is God in this Jesus. He must be the one the Jews have been looking for, the Messiah. He had an intelligent faith. It was accurate. The Jews didn't. They had a distorted image of God. And therefore, they, they missed the greatest opportunity that could have ever been afforded to them, the very presence of their Messiah. Now, an intelligent faith is, first of all, accurate. It's accurate. We are seeing God and his truth in the way that it actually is. This Roman centurion, in spite of a lack of a lot of scriptural teaching, did. But many of the Jews didn't. And today, we can still have very distorted images of God. I mean, it's not unusual at all to find people that just sort of have more or less a superstitious faith. They, um, they really don't know anything firsthand about God. They really, truly don't. But they, they feel that God, you know, expects certain things of them. So they just kind of go through the motions and they do those things. I jotted down a few of these typical images of God that sometimes people have that are distorted they're not the way God is at all but some have a a ritualistically appe appeased God they they believe that God is really concerned about them doing certain rituals as long as they do these certain rituals they can pretty much live any way they want they, they have a small-minded God who just wants them to do certain things a certain way then you have some people that have sort of an indifferent creator uh, folks whoever's man in the, the, the heater you missed that one over there it's still burning me up up here somebody could please turn that down um, you have an indifferent creator. It's the idea that, that somebody created everything and then they just step back. And he's just kind of kind of watching with amusement, you know, what's going on. But, he, but he's indifferent. Some people have that sort of an image of God. And all these images of God, they shape the way we develop. They, they cause us to react to circumstances in various ways. Another one is that some people have sort of a kind of a tolerant, sleepy, grandfatherly God. You know, he's kind of rocking in his heavenly recliner. And he just kind of looks over the edge of heavens and every once in a while and goes, <laughs> boy, oh boy, I, I get it. You know, you and I, we got a special deal going. You know, he, he's not too concerned how you live. You can have a special relationship with him. He'll pretty much agree with anything you want to do. Some people have a God like that. He's the good old boy upstairs. We're fine. Some people have a doctrinally meticulous God. These people are really argumentative and boring. Um, they come to churches like this or churches all over the country and they sit scrupulizing everything that's said because they believe that God is more concerned that we get every little doctrinal issue right and then he's pleased with us and if you're off on just one doctrinal issue oh he can't stand you then you're you know and so they, they, they're judgmental and they're boring and they're argumentative but sometimes that's the image that reigns in their heart 
Then there's some people that have kind of this politically active God, you know, that all he cares about is social justice. He wants to redistribute the world's wealth and that sort of thing. Some have an angry cosmic cop sort of a God. You know, he just kind of sits in heaven with his cosmic uh, baton and he's going ready to whack you as soon as you get out of line. You know, he's going to cause bad things to come your way. Some have a perfectionistic parent God. This is a God that you can never please. He always wants a little more. He always wants you to run a little faster and jump a little higher and try a little harder and you can do better. And he's never quite pleased with you. You just can't relax with this kind of a God. Some have a cosmic bellhop God. And this one is, is kind of prevalent today in a certain uh, segment of Christianity. This is the belief that God's desire, his greatest desire, is just to serve us. He's our bellhop. You know, you just kind of pick up the phone and you ask for room service. Call Jesus up on the line and he'll give you whatever you want, you know. Do you, do you need a miracle? He'll give you a miracle. Do you want your body healed? He'll give you instant healing. You name it, you claim it, you believe it before it happens and he'll give you anything you want. These people fill stadiums. They have big TV and radio programs. They bring in millions of dollars to naive people who are just trying to feed their selfishness on God, to use God to get things instead of surrendering themselves to God and letting him mold and shape them. This appeasement God, though, but all he wants is if you have the magic faith formula, you can have whatever you want. Nonsense. What, that, that's not an accurate depiction of God anywhere in the Bible. And those that believe that are setting themselves up for tremendous falls because they don't get the things that they're pursuing. And they live with delusion and they fill stadiums and people doing false miracles and they all swear it's true and it just makes a mockery really of Christianity. Now, I want to take this a little bit deeper because there are some other false distorted images of God that some of us might be carrying and they're affecting us detrimentally and, and we may not be quite aware of it. Let me show you a few that I have on a, on a graph here and I think it's in your program and your handout we gave you as well. Kind of try to follow me on this though. If you get the first part, it'll come clear. How the good news, meaning the truth about God and about Christ, becomes bad news. Uh, there's God, that, and then you have encode the good news. Now what that means is that we need to go to the source, which is God's word. God has revealed himself to us and preserved the record in the Bible. And the only way we can get an accurate, intelligent faith is from scripture, directly from scripture for ourselves. So we are to take scripture and encode the good news, put it into our heads, but then we need to decode the bad news. Now let me show you how this works. The truth about God, for example, is that he is loving and caring. But if we grew up in, a, in an environment, in a family, with our caretakers who were unhealthy, had unhealthy interpersonal relationships during our early developmental years, we may have had caretakers or parents that were hateful and unconcerned. Therefore, our image of God is going to tend to be like that. We're going to kind of never feel comfortable with God. We're always going to feel he's probably, he's probably hateful. He's just this big bully in the sky that wants to tell everybody what to do. Again, we know that the scripture says God is good and merciful, but if we grew up in an environment where our parents or caregivers were mean and unforgiving, there's a lot of families where people don't forgive anybody for anything, well then we, we kind of think that God might be probably like that, that you slip up one time and that's it for you. There's no forgiveness. We know that God from Scripture is steadfast and reliable, but we might have grown up in a family that our caretakers or our parents were very unpredictable and untrustworthy. Therefore, we have a hard time trusting God. We're always wondering if he's going to suddenly flake out on us or, or change his mind about us. These images get embedded, and, and we, we have distorted feelings and responses to God. Let me go quickly through some more now that you kind of get how it goes. We know that the Scripture says... God is really full of unconditional grace. But if we grew up in an environment where conditional approval was given, that's kind of like you're treated really nice and warm and fuzzy and loving if you get good grades, but if you get bad grades, you're really treated pretty coldly. Well, that, that, that sinks in our hearts, and we start thinking that God's probably that way. If I'm really, really good and read my Bible all the time, he loves me, but if I, if I don't do that, he probably doesn't like me, you know? God, we know from Scripture, is present all the time, always available to us, anywhere, all the time, any condition. But maybe we grew up in a family where the ones we needed most were absent. They can be present and still be absent. How many know that? How many know that a parent can be utterly unavailable and still be right there physically, you know? And so you start feeling like maybe God's kind of like that and you, you can't be comfortable and trust him completely. We know that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift, it says in the book of James. But maybe we grew up in a family where our parents were takeaway experts. They were killjoys. They seemed to take sinister delight in just depriving us of even the slightest legitimate joys of childhood. And so we kind of start thinking maybe God 
is kind of like that too, that if I trust him completely and start obeying him, it's going to take all the fun out of my life. He really doesn't care about me. He just wants to control me. See how this thing can work. One last one. We know that God is nurturing and affirming, but if we grew up in an environment where there was criticism and our parents or caregivers were impossible to please, we'll tend to see God that way, even though it's not true. We know that God is accepting, but if we grew up in an environment where we experience a lot of rejection, we'll tend to think that God could reject us too. We know that God is holy, just, fair, and impartial, but once again, if we grew up in an environment where there was unjust, unfair, and partial, we'll start tending to think that God might be that way too. So, this is a good time to ask ourselves, do we have an accurate image of God? Um, and if we think we do, what are we basing that on? Because if our image of God is only based on fragments that we receive from childhood experiences in and out of church, or fragments that we've heard, heard, even from me, heard, um, but we've never gone to God's chosen place of revelation, this book, this amazingly wonderful, valuable book, and saw with our own eyes what God has to say about himself we don't really necessarily have an accurate image of God. And our faith is going to struggle to ever be an intelligent one because if we don't have an accurate faith, it can't be an intelligent faith. We might be expecting things of God that he's not uh, about at all. Listen to what it says in Psalm 119, verse 89, about the word of God. It says, Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. The unfolding of your words give light. It gives light understanding to the simple how do we get an intelligent faith where do we get an accurate image of God from his word from his word now of course God has, has put teachers in the church and so forth but even when people like me teach I'm always trying to get you to see for yourself not have a secondhand faith firsthand faith so you know for yourself what God says about himself and about life from his word so actor some of you are probably very familiar with him his name is Ian McKellen he was in Lord of the Rings. He was Gandalf. How many remember Gandalf? You know, he was kind of a heroic figure, you know. Um, let me just tell you a little more about Ian. Ian has an interesting habit. Whenever he goes to a hotel and stays in a hotel, the first thing he does is he seeks out the Gideon Bible in the hotels. You know how Gideons put Bibles in hotels? He seeks out the Gideon Bible. Do you feel really warm and fuzzy about Gandalf now? Are you really glad that he's your hero? You better listen a little further. When he gets this Gideon Bible, he goes right to Leviticus chapter 18 and finds verse 22, and he tears it out of the Bible. And here's his reason why. He's a homosexual. And that verse specifically condemns homosexual activity. Now, Ian McKellen doesn't know the Bible very well because if he did, he'd know that it's mentioned many other times and places that it's, it's condemned. It's not God's design. It's not his highest for us. But this is what people do when they find sometimes the accurate image of God. We try to twist it into a more comfortable image so that we can live out our own desires, even if they are destructive. Let me share with you one other thing that's very similar. There was in 2009 a um, gallery in Glasgow, Scotland, an uh, art gallery, and the, uh, the art dealers there had a very interesting display. They had this big Bible, and beside it they had blank pages so that people could just come and randomly put their ideas into the Bible. They could change the Bible. Uh, it didn't have, it was, it, it was the idea that it's just a bunch of ideas of men, so it's, it's up for grabs, it's up for change. And needless to say, there were a lot of very vulgar and lewd things that were put there, and then just some crazy things. But the idea was that we can twist Scripture, we can change it, rather than go to this precious revelation and learn the truth about God and about life. Now one little interesting aside, when they did this in Glasgow, let me tell you what didn't happen. Even though blasphemous things were written in this Bible about God, let me tell you what didn't happen. They didn't burn the city of Glasgow down. They didn't behead the art directors that put this exhibit on. Do you know why they didn't burn the city down and behead them? Because Christians don't do that. But how many of you know, had this been the Koran, that they tried to do that to. How many of you know they would have burned the stinking city down and they would have beheaded, if possible, the art gallery leaders? How many, I'm serious, I want your hands on this. How many of you notice you need to know that we're dealing with the most evil religion ever been put on the planet? Allah is a, demon, a bloodthirsty demon from hell. He is not God. He is not the God of the Bible. 
And you need to understand that. Now, I'm not saying every Muslim is a terrible, bloodthirsty demon from hell. But if they follow their own scripture, this is why we get all these burnings and killings and, and so forth. All right, that was just an aside. That was just kind of a freebie. Let me go on with my talk. Accurate faith. Um, in Psalm 25, the Lord says, show, urges us to make this prayer a good prayer for me, for you, for all of us. It says, show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth. God guides us in his truth. If we don't have his truth, we don't have his guidance. We can't have an accurate faith without experiencing God's revealing of himself through his word. The unfolding of your words gives light. We had read, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. I know I've made a lot of emphasis about scripture, but, but bear with me. I'm going to do something as fast as I can, but I want you to, to understand just what a treasure we have here and how horrible it is to neglect it. I, I don't mean to guilt trip you, but I mean it's just like we're cheating ourselves out of something phenomenal. Let me show you just 10, really quickly, 10 evidences that this thing is, is divine in origin. It's nothing like it on the planet. First of all is unity, the unity of the Bible. You may or may not know some of this. It was written by 40 different human authors that the Spirit of God used. 40 different authors, three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Over 1,500 year time span. Okay, and yet when you read it, three different languages, you know, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic. But when you read it, you find you're meeting the same entity, the same unified mind from cover to cover. Nothing like it on the planet. It's indestructibility. Diocletian, Roman emperor in 303, he thought that he had actually destroyed all the Bibles in existence. 20 years later, Constantine became the Roman emperor. He became a Christian, and Bibles were flooding all over. It's indestructibility. The, the communist Chinese tried to destroy it. The Russians tried to destroy it. It will never be destroyed. Jesus said, my words will never pass away. And so it's been. It's historical accuracy. Every time they, they look for a place that the Bible talks about, they'll find the evidence of it historically and archaeologically. It's again and again proven itself to be accurate. Prophecy. The Bible is different than any other religious writing in that one-third of it approximately is predictive prophecy. God predicts the future. Specifically about men, cities, nations, situations. Jesus alone, there was probably 60-some prophecies about the Messiah. Just eight of those prophecies coming to pass would be statistically impossible but they all came to pass with him. The Bible said that Israel would be reborn as a nation. We've lived to see that. It said that they would regain Jerusalem as their capital. We've seen that in 1967. It happened. The Bible prophecy is being fulfilled right in our day and age. The alignment of the nations, particularly the Islamic nations. The Bible predicted all that in advance. We're living to see it. It's universal influence. Every generation... Every nation, every culture, this book has had profound influence. People are drawn to it and drawn to its author anywhere, anytime in history is placed. It's unique care and copy. Now, I could spend a lot of time just talking about that. There's no other book in history that has been copied so carefully as the Bible and passed down. And we have more manuscript evidences of the New Testament than any other ancient historical document in existence. It's circulation. Every year the Bible is a bestseller. It's circulated globally. It's going into every language. It's, it's the goal of a lot of uh, translating groups right now to get the Bible into every language this generation. It accurately depicts life today. It tells us who we are, how we're, uh, why we're in this condition, how to get out of it, what's the truth about life. It, it's very accurate for the way things are today. And then finally, it's life-transforming power. When people let the author of this book get into their hearts, it inevitably changes them in a positive way. Even if they were already wonderful people, they become better people when they let the author of this book get into their life. So just some quick reasons to, to cherish, but more importantly, to do what this next verse says. Listen, listen to 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, All Scripture is God-breathed or God-inspired. And it's useful for teaching. Let God teach you through his word. It's useful for rebuking. We need to be rebuked. It's useful for correcting and training in righteousness. We need all of that. So that the man or woman of God, either one, you know, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. The old King James used to say, who rightly divides the word of truth. And I think there's some wisdom in that, that translation, but this correctly handles okay too. But do you see what it's urging us to do to get into God's word? Know it for ourselves. That's where we get an accurate 
image of God, that's where we can have an intelligent faith. It starts with an accurate understanding. This Roman centurion, he got it. He knew who Jesus was when most of the people of his day did not because their minds were not open and they were prejudiced. So an intelligent faith, it's an accurate faith, but it's also an active faith. This Roman centurion, he didn't just keep his faith to himself. Uh, it's not unusual, you know, people today that say, well, you know, I, you know, I have kind of this faith in God, but it's kind of I keep it to myself. It's, it's kind of personal. It's, it's between God and I. Really? Then you don't obviously read the Bible. Because Jesus commanded his followers when he rose out of a cave like this, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you to the very end of the age. That's not keeping it to yourself. That's taking it to others deliberately. That's what this Roman centurion was doing. He didn't only have an accurate faith he had an active faith he saw his servant had needs and he saw that Jesus was the only one that could meet those needs and he saw that he had an opportunity to connect the two of them and that's what people with active faith are all about they first of all they realize that every single person matters to God that he loves them this Roman centurion knew that his slave servant who would have been considered a Joe nobody maybe not even considered human by some but he was not that way in his sight and he knew he was not that way in the sight of Jesus. He knew that this servant mattered to Christ and that Christ would care about his condition. An active faith knows that God cares about everybody, that he'll reach out to people, not that everybody's reachable. And an active faith tries to be that bridge, tries to be that, that, that person that gets in between and links Christ and people together, tries to awaken people that Christ can do something for them that no one else can do. Christ knew that he, or, or this, the centurion knew that the, Jesus could do for his servant what no one else could do. And people with active faith, that's the way they think. They're always looking around at their circle of influence. They're always praying for the people around them. They're always looking for opportunities to, to link these people somehow with Christ. Maybe they invite them to church. Maybe they give them a CD of a message or a DVD of a message. Maybe they give them a little booklet. Maybe they give them a music DVD or something. But, but they're always looking because they know that the deepest needs of a human soul cannot be reached by any or meant reached or fulfilled by anyone other than Christ that's an act of faith they don't just stay still keep it to themselves this guy also he understood that this was Christ and you gotta get this part that this was Christ's purpose for that time in history he knew that Jesus was doing multiple miracles multiple why because that's God's plan to do multiple miracles all the time each and every day all around the planet forever that's what some quacks teach but that's not what the Bible teaches Jesus did all those miracles because they were his credentials they showed that he was the one the only son of the living God the creator of the universe the Messiah the Savior they were his credentials to show that he was totally utterly different than anyone he gave power to his apostles to do some signs and after that if you study Christian history all the miraculous things tended to, to phase away. Do miracles still occur here and there? Yes they do but they're called miracles because they don't happen every day. Okay if they happened every day they wouldn't be miracles. Some false teachers teach that we ought to see all the same number of miracles by ordinary Christians that Jesus did and that sets people up for being deceived and that's why stadiums are full of people that are deluded believing in false miracles by the thousands because they don't know that God has different methodologies for different times they don't know how to rightly handle the word of truth this centurion got it he knew this was part of Jesus agenda at that time to do healings and so he cooperated with it he takes uh, he gets his servant linked up with Jesus what is Jesus number one purpose in this age I just said it to you go into all the world make disciples of all nations baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you and I am with you to the very end of the age that's his purpose now it's not to fill stadiums with false miracles and do weird uh, TV religious TV programs with big eye makeup and stuff like that that's not his purpose I mean, come on, man. We, we, we ought to grow up. We dishonor God with that nonsense. 
We, that, all that name it, claim it stuff, thinking that's faith, that's not faith, that's presumption. That's the seeking to manipulate God. Faith says, I'm gonna find out what God's program is and I'm gonna trust him and cooperate. And his program now is to link people, link people. Do you have an active faith? Are you, are you looking for opportunities? Are you seizing opportunities to try to link people up with Christ? That's what an active faith does. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 7 about an active faith. He said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a what? A wise man, hearing and putting them into practice. Wise man who built his house on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a what? A foolish man who built his house on the sand. Now, what are you? You wise? You foolish? We're all going to leave here, I promise. <laughs> are we going to leave as those that say, you know what, man? I heard God today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to so build an intelligent faith because I know Jesus is thrilled with an intelligent faith. I know an intelligent faith blesses others. I'm going to get into God's word. I'm, I'm going to get serious. Or we go out of here and we say, that was interesting. <laughs> and we do nothing. Wise, foolish. Wise, hear, and practice. Foolish, hear, and do nothing. Which are we? James 2 says this. It says, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, notice an active faith, it is, what does it say? dead when people say oh yeah I got, I got my faith in God me, me and the man upstairs we're okay you know but, but there's no there's nothing that you can see in their life that shows that there's active cooperation with God uh, that's self-deception that's not real faith in the book of Hebrews what I alluded to at the beginning of this message if you look at the 11th chapter it's called the you know the heroes hall of fame and, and it talks about all these people that had faith 15 characters are listed every one of them did something it says Noah had faith so he built the ark you know Abraham had faith so he left Ur of the Chaldees and on and on it goes faith and action they go together and when there's no action there's no faith when there's no obedience there's no faith listen to what Paul says about the relationship between obedience and faith the apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1 verse 1 Paul a servant of Christ Jesus through him and for his name's sake we received grace and apostleship okay but, but Paul why did you receive the grace and apostleship why 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 to call people from among all the Gentiles okay but what else to the to call them to what Paul to call them to the what does it say the obedience but what kind of obedience what kind of obedience where does, where does the obedience come from from faith what did I say at the beginning of the message God could use force God could use fear but he doesn't he uses faith he wants us to obey him because we trust him and then it's spontaneous and it's joyful and we are eager to obey it's the obedience that comes from faith he says the same thing at the end of the book of Romans he says so that all nations might believe there's faith and what follows obey him Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. How many know that old hymn? Own up to it. Yeah. See, I know those old hymns. I don't like them, but I, <laughs> I know them. <laughs> my, old, my old stodgy Baptist church I had for seven and a half years, that's all we sang was those things. But uh, no more. No, I'm not, that, listen, they, they were wonderful. They're full of great content and theology for the time of day, but you know what I mean. We, it was a different day. So uh, I like our music. But, but anyway, the principle is legitimate. Trust and obey. Uh, there's no other way to experience what God wants us to experience and then we have the evidence in ourselves of his goodness so an intelligent faith it's an accurate faith it's based on a personal your personal knowledge of God from his word and it's active man you you get at it you cooperate with God's purpose you you don't just sit and drink it in drink it in it's not just all about you and Jesus it's about you taking Jesus to the world and linking that world and him together the best that you know how. Let me close with a story that I've shared before, but I think it's just a, a good one to kind of round this one out. It's about a guy named Emile Calais. He was a philosopher. He lived between 1894 and 1981. He actually was alive up until 1981. And uh, he was born in France, and he grew up in a very atheistic environment. His education was very atheistic. He went to World War I and was just devastated, 
devastated by what he saw. Couldn't believe what human beings were going through and doing to one another. He himself was badly wounded and uh, was out of the war, just a, a terrible wound to his arm, but he lived. He ended up marrying a girl that he had met earlier in Germany. She was a, a Scotch-Irish Christian. Now, she was obviously not a strong, intelligent Christian, or she would have known that the Bible says, don't marry an unbeliever. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, don't be yoked together with unbelievers, talking about a marital relationship. Um, anyway, she uh, married Emile Calais, this, this atheistic philosopher, and he was very blunt with her. He said, now, I want you to understand one thing. You're a Christian. I'm not. There will never be a Bible brought into our house. Do you understand that? And her being a not-so-strong Christian, she agreed to that. She shouldn't have. That was wrong. But she did. She agreed to it. And their marriage went on, and, you know, it had some typical ups and downs and so forth. And then he went through a very troubling period, having come out of World War I and seeing the atrocities and wondering, what is, what is the meaning of life? What's going on? Does anything really matter do we have any security at all and he was tormented being a philosopher and he searched and he searched and he read voraciously and finally he came to this feeling he said I want a book that understands me that, that kind of makes me known to myself that, that knows what's going on inside me and he couldn't find a book like that so he started with this idea that he would take quotes that he thought were outstanding and he would then compile them together paste them into a book and it would become the book that would understand him and he did this for years. He you know, would find these quotes, compile them, put them in his little book. Well, finally the day came that he felt like he had this thing filled up. He went outside into his yard. He sat under a tree. And he started to read his book, the book that was going to understand him, full of quotes that he himself valued and had found. And when he started reading it, man, his excitement was really high. Cut from that part of the story to a second thing that was happening simultaneously. That same day, that same time that he's in the backyard reading his finally compiled and completed volume, his wife decides to take their baby for a walk in a stroller. It's a warm day in France, and she's not familiar terribly with the neighborhood, and she's, you know, just going around the town and looking at things, finds herself on these bumpy brick roads, and it was too bumpy for the baby, so she got off of that, and it led her to this smoother road, and then she finds this beautiful stone building with an open staircase, and she can see that it's open inside, see some books and things, looks like it might be a library, picks up her baby and goes inside. She looks, there's lots of books. And then at the very end of this long hallway with the books, she sees an elderly guy with very white hair. And she goes up to him and asks him. And he says, well, this is actually a church library. You're in a church. And she says, oh. And then she says to him, she says, do, do you have a copy of the Bible in French that I could have? He said, yeah, of course. And he gives her a Bible. And she starts to leave. And then as she starts to leave, pangs of guilt hit her because she knows what she had, you know, lived up to all these years with her husband. He said, never will a Bible come into the house. And now she, had, she felt like she betrayed his confidence and she had violated his respect. And she's got this Bible and she's troubled and she's going home. And by the time she gets home, she just can't take it anymore. She feels awful. She go, walks into the house at the same time Emil, who had been reading his book, the book that would understand him, he had just completed it. He started it emotionally this high. By the time he finished it, he was deeply disappointed because he realized it didn't work. It was just compilations that he liked. It didn't do what he had hoped it would do, and he was deeply discouraged, still depressed and in search. They cross in the living room. His wife immediately bursts out. She says, I'm so sorry, Emil. I've done something terrible. I I've just got to tell you. Uh, I, I know you told me never to bring this book in the house, but I did. I, I purchased, or, or I, I didn't purchase, I received this Bible, and I've got a Bible. And he said, a Bible? And she said, yeah, I, I know, I'm sorry. He says, no, 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 let me have it, let me have it. And he darts out of the room, and he starts to read it. He had never read a Bible in his entire life, ever. He opens it up randomly to the Sermon on the Mount. He's completely captivated. He reads on hour after hour after hour, well into the night. His own words, he said, and then it happened. I met the one in the book, and my life changed that night. And he goes from being a philosopher to ending up being a theologian at Princeton here in this country later on in his life, and then died, like I say, in 1981 an intelligent faith, an intelligent man, a brilliant man who followed Christ fully for the rest of his days. Is your faith, is my faith, an intelligent faith? 
Is it accurate? Is it based on firsthand knowledge of what God's revealed about himself? Because we can only trust what he's revealed about himself. And is it active? Can, can we point, if God were writing our story, would there be something, you know, the centurion got into God's word, would there be something that said, and, and you did this and that showed your faith? Is it an intelligent faith? Or is it maybe just kind of a religious superstition? Some of us just kind of have a superstitious thing. It's kind of like, you know, I, I, I have respect for God, but that's as far as it goes. I hope that changes today, man. I, I, hope, I hope somehow the Spirit of God has made a little probe, a little dent, a little chip in each and every one of our hearts that will continue to widen until we absorb all that God wants us to understand about himself and about life for this age. Let's, let's pray. First of all, Father, we, we thank you so much for stories like this one. You, you take this guy. He's the last guy anybody would have ever dreamt would be one of your, your charmed favorites. And you go out of your way to let us know how excited you are when we have an intelligent faith. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be much of anything. Just those that humbly, like children, trust you entirely and seek to obey you completely. And you delight. Uh, thank you for the encouragement from that. And thank you that you have made yourself so knowable to us that, that we can have open access to you any time we want it. Um, please, Father, you, you know how quickly we get distracted. You know how quickly we get busy. Help us, help us to, to make good decisions right now that will carry on for days and weeks and months and years to come. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.